We're in a brand new series that we started last week called Chosen. And one of the things I'm so grateful for is that God does indeed choose us. Um, in life, as we go through uh, the, 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 the ups and the downs of life, sometimes we don't, we don't feel chosen. We don't feel wanted. Uh, we don't feel like uh, we're at the top of somebody's list. Well, maybe that different kind of list, you know what I'm saying? But we certainly don't feel chosen. And uh, I'm so grateful that as we began to discover last week that God has indeed chosen us. In fact, we started a brand new four-week message series we're calling Chosen, and in it we're discovering our unique identity in Christ. Last week we explored the truth that God has chosen us, and one of the themes that we talked about last week was this idea of a neighborhood pickup game, right? Whether it's football or, or basketball, what happens is you have these two individual team captains that get together and they go through one by one and they pick the various players and nobody wants to pick be picked last right everybody wants it if you're not the captain you want to be picked you know certainly first you know even in the middle is okay but nobody wants to be picked last and what we realized about last week is that uh that last person you know the team uh the the last captain he usually gets stuck with that person right and uh, the truth is, is that God doesn't get stuck with us. God chooses us. How many of you are grateful for that? And so, so much for us to be grateful for. In fact, last week we, we talked about two truths when it comes to God choosing us. The first one is that God picks us. He picks us. He's not stuck with us. And I'm so grateful that in God's infinite wisdom, he looked at every one of us here today, whether you're a first-time guest, whether you've been part of Junction Community Church for a very long time, maybe you decided you were going to tune in and click uh, and watch us today. Whatever the case is, God chose you. God knows you by name. He knows your story. He knows what he's doing in your life, and he chose you on purpose. He didn't get stuck with you. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you, and so God picks us. He's not stuck with us. The second thing we kind of unpacked last week was this idea that we are his, not our own. We are his and not our own, and with that in mind, uh, our takeaway last week was pretty uh, uh, clear for us. It was we are handpicked and chosen to be his. We are handpicked and chosen to be his. Now, I shared last week the story of, of going and picking green chili. How many of y'all like love green chili? Um, yeah, okay, some of y'all, some of y'all like, man, I don't, I don't know if I like any kind of chili, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and the truth is, is that when you go and you pick chili, one of the things that happens is you get into a big field, and there's plants, and they're all filled with chili, but not all the chilies are ready. And so you really have to go through and hand pick each of those chilies. And so you go through there and you hand pick one and and, and then you decide this is a really good one. I want to keep this one. And uh, and then before you know it, you have a couple of bushels full of of chilies and then you go home and you make some really yummy stuff. But ultimately, the, the, the plant ripens at different times. It doesn't ripen at the same time and you've got to go through and you've got to hand pick the chili. So we are handpicked and chosen to be his. I also learned this same principle uh, not too many years ago. Well, you know, 12 years ago. I was visiting uh, Costa Rica, and uh, my wife and I were there uh, learning Spanish. We were uh, studying Spanish, and as we were there studying and learning and spent six weeks there, uh, we learned about coffee. And how many of y'all like coffee? How many of y'all, how many of y'all don't just like coffee? You're like, I need coffee, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, uh, I saw, I'm probably going to botch this, but I saw a sign the other day that said uh, about, my, about our spouses, you know, like, I love you, but I, I, I love you better after coffee or something like that, you know, and isn't that true? Coffee just kind of helps us go, get going, but here's the thing. Uh, in Costa Rica, they grow some amazing coffee. You may have seen it before. Terra Zoo is really uh, popular uh, from that region. And uh, one of the things that happens is uh, you go through and you can visit a plantation. And so you learn all the process of the very earliest plants and how that goes through and how it processes. And ultimately, in the end, you realize that at harvest time, uh, the cherry beans uh, are actually what they call cherries. And so they're red when they pick them, but the plant is not all ready at once. And so every day, uh, people have to go in and harvest when harvest time comes around. And those cherries, those bean coffee beans are hand-picked. And, and so you just got to know that the coffee you had this morning was hand-picked, like it was chosen just for you. And God hand picks us. We are handpicked and chosen by God. How many of you are grateful for that this morning? God handpicks us. What it does is it gives us this great amount of 
confidence that not only are we handpicked, but we're not an afterthought. We're not overlooked by God. We're chosen intentionally, and God has a purpose for us. And really, this should give us the confidence to know not only who we are, but more importantly, whose we are, that we belong to God and that he has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And so as we continue today, I want us to understand that not only does God choose us, but then he works on changing us from the inside out. So God chooses us, and then he begins to work on changing us. Now, it's been said the only thing that is constant is change. That's the only thing that's constant. And isn't that true? In life, we can certainly identify with change as there's so many changes going on around us, going on inside of us. Depending on your age, your body's changing, and you're like, man, this is not fun. Um, depending on where your stage of life or, or what you're going through, certainly things are changing. Now, I want you to think with me for uh, just a moment this morning. What did 10 years ago in your life look like? Think about it. What was 10 years? Some of you are like, man, I can't even remember. It was a blur 10 years ago. Man, I was, having a, I was having a heyday of a time, and I don't really remember a whole lot of it. It was a lot of late nights, and, you know, but the truth is, is 10 years ago, what was it like for you? I mean, what were you doing? Were you in the same uh, career? Were you in the same job? Were you... Uh, uh, you know, not only what were you doing, but uh, where were you? Were you living in the same place? And, and who were you doing life with? I mean, there are so many questions, but over the last decade of your life, I can, I, I can guess that many of those things have changed. Whatever, wherever you were 10 years ago, a lot of those things changed. Um, in fact, we see it happening in technology. This week, uh, Google celebrated 20 years. They had their 20th birthday. And for if you're if you're young in this place, you think Google always existed. It didn't, you know. Uh, it wasn't always there. And when it first came onto the scene, it wasn't at all what we know it today. I mean, it has developed and changed and has become a verb. Have you Googled it, you know? Um, and it's just changed everything. So technology has advanced. When I was a kid, uh, we, we had skateboards. But if you grew up in the 80s, not only did you have skateboards, they were different. I don't know what, I, I always call them fat boards. I don't know what they're called, but they were like different design. Um, you know, there was a fat tail on the backside, and usually there was this plastic part underneath so you can, you know. And, uh, and, and if you grew up in, in the 80s, you also watched a movie called Back to the Y'all got it, man. Back to the future. And in Back to the Future, you went from skateboards to then there was this uh, hoverboard. Y'all remember that? And so technology, some of you are just like looking at me. You're too young. You're like, this is, this is funny, but I'm just smiling because I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, but the truth is, is it's changed uh, drastically technology. In fact, you went from the, all, this idea of skateboards and they kind of evolved and I remember seeing the first evolution. I'm like, that's a weird skateboard. You can ride it frontwards or backwards. That's like, that's not normal. And then they came up with these long boards. You know, I'm like, what's this do? Uh, you got a long board here. Becca, why don't you come on in? She's riding a long board. You may not want to move because she might run you over. Um, she's got a long board here. And I see her ride that thing. And I'm like, hey, good job, man. Um, can I try it? She's like, no. She's like, we want you to finish the message, Dad. Okay, okay, got you covered. Uh, but then, you know, you go from these long boards to all of a sudden you get into this, what, nowadays you have a hoverboard, right? But it's not like we saw these hoverboards back in the day, these hoverboards of, of you know, uh, you're, you're kind of levitated and you're flying. They're, they're more like this. Miss Jada, would you come on in? Hey, here comes Jada on her hoverboard. And uh, she, look, she's all cool and calm. Can, like, can you do, like, any tricks or anything? Can you, like, spin around or... You know, oh, whoa, yeah, just, yeah, whoa. Oh, and just like that, you just go have a seat. Okay, all right, it's pretty calm. So hoverboards, I, can I try that one? She's like, no. Hey, here's the thing, like I've actually got on it, but I'm not, very, I'm not a very big fan of it. And in fact, the other day I got on it and I tried stepping off and it like moved and thank God I'm fast because I, I caught myself, but I was kind of embarrassed because my small group was there. Um, right? We were like, okay, he fell on his... So I didn't want to do that in front of you guys, so I just thought Jada would come in. But 10 years ago, a lot of things were a lot different. Things changed. The only constant in life is change. But here's the thing. A lot of things stay the same. You know, for me, one of the things that's the same is that 10 years ago, I was pastoring Junction Community Church. It was great. But I'll tell you what, 10 years ago, uh, 
I wasn't the same pastor I am today. It was a lot different. I was, first of all, younger, and, uh, and second of all, I, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, you know, I had been pastoring this church for a whole year, and it was like, okay, this is crazy. I didn't expect all this. Can I just go back to being a staff guy where somebody else does all the real work, and I just get to have fun, you know? And, uh, but fast forward, I'm still here. That hasn't changed, and I thank God for that. I thank God that it hasn't changed. But let me tell you, for those of you that are here today, thank God I'm not that guy. I'm a, I've changed, you know, so I may have not changed jobs, but I'm a different pastor today. With all the things that change around us, with all the things that are changing constantly, there's one thing we could rest assured of today that doesn't change, and that's the unchanging nature of God. In fact, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he declares this, I, the Lord, do not change. And so we can rest assured that he does not change. His character is the same. In fact, we see this same thing mimicked in the book of Hebrews as we fast forward to the New Testament. In chapter 13, it says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so we rest assured that God has an unchanging nature, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now here's the thing about God's unchanging nature that I love so much, and that is that a part of his unchanging nature is to work out absolute life change in our lives. And so we can rest assured that that's one of the things that from beginning of time to this very day and until the end of time, he will continue to work out absolute life change in you and I. And so not only do we understand through this message series that we're in that God chooses us, but then we realize that he's changing us. And that's a good thing. It's a real good thing. But here's the way God works. God doesn't work like we work. He's different. In fact, God changes us from the inside out. But we oftentimes want to change things from the outside in. We do it backwards. And I'm going to just tell you, God's way is better and he wants to change us from the inside out. He doesn't want to change us from the outside in. And, and I'll tell you, the way we, the way we uh, kind of mess that up is we, we want to do what I would call behavior modification. Like we just want to modify behavior. We want things to look good on the outside. We want things to look right. But we really don't care how they look on the inside, right? And, uh, and so uh, what we do is we just want to do behavior modification, not character modification. God does it the opposite way. He wants to produce character from the inside that changes how we behave on the outside. Let me show you how that works. So Jada was riding around on her hoverboard, and that was pretty cool, right? You know, like it just looks cool. Like it makes you want to get on it, and it makes you think that you can do that. You know, spin around. When I get on it, it's more like. <laughs> but can you imagine if I just said, Jada, no riding the hoverboard, because I was trying to get her from not riding that hoverboard here in church, you know. No riding. And if, if she takes that quite literal, she would just know that I can't ever ride my hoverboard ever again because dad said no riding the hoverboard, right? And we're just like, we want to just change our kids. We want to modify their behavior. Don't do that. Don't do this. But then, you know, we really don't give them the character reason behind it. We just, wanna, we just want the bad stuff to change, right? Any parents in here, you're like, man, if I can just get my kid to stop picking his nose, we'd be okay. If I can just get my kid to stop doing this, we'd be all right. If I can just get my kid to stop the bad behavior, they would be all right, right? We want to stop the bad stuff. But really, it's the backwards way of doing it. We can't just modify behavior, we have to start with the heart. And so in that particular scenario, as I talk about Jada riding her hoverboard, it would be more appropriate for me to say, hey, let me give you some context. So you shouldn't ride your hoverboard in here. And here's the reason why. There are people walking around, man, they're not as, they're, they're not as fast as you. You know, you might trip them up. They might not know which direction you're going. They, they're, they're, they're a little bit older, you know, they're like older than you. And, and they may hurt themselves, and that wouldn't be a good thing, you know. And so really giving some reason behind it. Again, we want to change the outside, but God starts with the inside out. And so as we consider the, the nature of God to bring about absolute life change in our lives, I want to start re with revisiting a verse from last week, and I want to go back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And I want to pick up one truth from here, and as we pick up one truth, um, we're going to unpack a couple of ideas today. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's special possession that you may be de- declare the praises of him who called you. And then here's the key phrase at the end, out of darkness into his wonderful light. Out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so not only does God choose us as we read this verse, but then he wants to transform us. It's what I would say, say is really, it's a metamorphosis. It's a drastic tra- transformation of absolute life change. And, and the change is this. The transformation is from dark to light. You can't get any more contrasting than that, right? Between night and day. And, and it's, it's really what it is. It's a, it's a complete 180 degree change uh, from walking in one direction to turning around and walking in the complete opposite direction. And so this life changes, again, from dark to light, from death to life. It's from walking with the crowd to walking against the crowd. How many of y'all sometimes you feel like you're just walking against the crowd? You're just like, man, I'm trying to live out my faith, but like it always feels like it's against the crowd. Like everybody else is doing this, but I'm feeling the, 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 the need to walk a different direction. It's what happened to Jesus himself when he experienced the death on the cross and then three days later the resurrection from the dead. And so it's, it's total and absolute life change. That's what happens. In fact, it's further explained in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, this transformation from dark to light. Let's read about it. It says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. I like that. You were once darkness. Now, here, here's the thing. I know, I know we like to like paint ourselves in a better light, right? We're like, well, I'm kind of dark, but I'm not as dark as, you know, I'm not as dark as, dark as, you know. I live with some real dark people, but I'm not that dark, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm kind of, and so, but here's the truth is that he says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. In fact, we've explored this text uh, in our Ephesian series over the summer uh, in greater detail, but I, needed, I felt like we needed to come back to it today. It says, live as children of light, children of light, for the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then it finishes in verse 10, uh, before we read on today, it says, and find out what pleases the Lord. Like, here's the deal. When we come to Christ, everything about us starts to change. And we start to completely uh, be transformed. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing that happens because we go from dark to light. Now, it doesn't mean that we're always light. <laughs> You're like, no, not always. You know, sometimes I, the dark side shows up. You know, sometimes the dark side shows up and, and he or she just wants to hang out and set up camp again. And, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But again, you were, you, were, you were dark, now you're light, and then it challenges us with this, and find out what pleases the Lord. So here's the idea. We want to live a life that pleases God. Not that we're ever, uh, we'll ever find perfection. That's not what we're looking for. We're not trying to earn salvation here. In fact, salvation is a free gift from God provided in the, in the sacrifice of Christ, provided in the resurrection of Christ. And so we're not trying to earn salvation, not in the least bit. What we're trying to do is say, God, you know what? Because you brought me out of darkness and into light, I want to live a life that pleases you. I want to live a life that honors you. I want the way I think. I want the way I talk. I want the way I act. I want the way I interact to honor you, to please you, and so we want to live this kind of life. I love this Ephesians uh, text here, because again, we come from darkness into light, and then we want to walk in this fruit of light that consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord, like what really pleases him. Not, not, not you know, and, and this is the challenge, is that so many times we confuse this to think, you know, what pleases the Lord so that I can be saved, so that I can make sure to enter heaven. Like, only Jesus' sacrifice on the cross does that. But then because of that, we want to say, God, with my life, all that I am, what pleases you? It goes on and it reads, continuing in Ephesians, it says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Have nothing to do with these fruitless deeds of darkness. It's like there's a complete transformation that begins to happen. Where we go from darkness to light, from death to to life, and all of a sudden, our lives are completely transformed. Now, I know some days it doesn't feel like it. Some days we still feel a little more dark uh, than, than, than the day before, and some days, you know, we feel all right. 
Coming in a Sunday morning, you know, we have a great worship experience. We hear some good word. We meet some good people. Everybody's got smiling faces on. And we walk away and we feel like, man, this feels good. Until that person cuts you off on the way out of the parking lot. And it's like, then the darkness comes out. You know what I'm saying? Darkness. Darkness. But it's this transformation that takes place in us that God really wants to highlight today in us, that he's changing us. In fact, this, this, this life change that we're talking about, God brings it about in our lives, and it can be summed up in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. This is a verse that we, ought, or 17 rather, this is a verse we talk about a lot when we, do di- uh, when we do baptisms, which are coming up actually in November. So if you've not been baptized and, and you're, you're wanting to take that step of faith that's coming up, you can sign up at the, uh, at the uh, Welcome Center. But therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. I love this, right? Because when we're talking about the fact that not only does God choose us, but then God wants to change us, this changing that he does in us is not superficial. It's not just fake and on the outside and in the Instagram photos, you know what I'm saying? No, this is the real deal kind of change from the inside out. It's the kind of change that actually calls us a new creation. Like we're new, we're completely new. And then there's an exchange that happens. The old is gone, the new is here. And basically, after you start following Jesus, you're no longer the same. Instead, instead, you are changed by God. The moment you start following Jesus, every part of your life will change. And I want you to listen to this well, because ultimately, your words, your actions, your thoughts, your desires, your priorities, your attitude, your relationships, every part of your life will change when you come into this life-giving relationship with Christ. When you become a new creation, it says the old has gone, the new is here. Everything changes. Now here's something I need you to understand, though. Is that God's changing work in us, and you may want to write this down, it happens in two ways. The first way is instantaneous. The first way is when we come to faith in Christ, when we, when we confess our, our, our need for Christ, when we confess that He indeed is our Lord and we recognize Him as the only Savior uh, for, for our lives, for our eternity, when we come to that, I mean, He changes us in an instant. And it's the kind of thing that you just, man. And I, I know you've experienced this, many of you here in this place, as you walked into here and, and you've heard a message, and then at the end we've talked about knowing Christ and accepting Christ, and as you did that, and you just lifted your hand, you said, I want to know Christ as my Lord, Lord and Savior. As you did that, in that moment, there was just a levity that came on you. All Everything felt different, and everything felt like instantaneously. Now, of course, you're still going home, uh, you know, to... to, to to the darkness side, you know, uh, you're still, you're still going to deal with dark people at work tomorrow, you're still, but all of a sudden, in that moment, didn't it feel all together different? And if it, it was just that peace came over you. But then here's the thing, God not only works instantaneously, but then there's the lifelong process of God changing us. And that's the one that none of us want to wait for. That's the one that none of us, in fact, when we pray, we pray things like, you know, God change her now. Because she's dark. She's darkness, all crazy, written all over it with nice and smiles and coffee. Not, not you, I was talking somebody else. And we just think in those terms, God changed them. We think, God, you know, yeah, some, this is a good word for somebody. And some of you, you're smiling. You're saying, I'm glad she's here. I'm glad he's here because he needs to get that darkness out of his life. And all I would say to you is God is maybe speaking to them, but more importantly, he's speaking to you, and he wants to change you. So not only does God choose us, but then God wants to change us. It's an instant work, but it's also a lifelong process. We are changed in the blink of an eye, and then we undergo the lifelong process of being changed just a little bit at a time. Kind of painful, right? It's like, man, I, don't, I, I thought I would be over this by now. I thought I would be different by now. Let me just say this thought. When it comes to life change, when it comes to God changing our hearts and our lives, first and foremost, he does all the heavy lifting. 
Ha, ah, that should make us feel better. He does all the heavy lifting. And I know we want to get in his way and we want to help, right? Um, especially when it comes to other people. Like, we're not so helpful when it comes to ourselves, but when it comes to other people, we're like, we, we really want to be helpful. We want to tell them where they're wrong, right? We want to tell them how they can change and be better and how they can do this differently. And, and yet, when, our, when it comes to us, we're like, I'm cool. I'm all right. You know, yeah, God's working on me, but he's taking his time, you know? For you, on the other hand, he better hurry up because if he don't, I'm about to, you know, spend, you think about your kids, you know, like, Jesus, just, just fix that problem with my child. And it better happen now because if not, I'm going to fix them, Lord. <laughs> and so it's a lifelong process. But God does all the heavy lifting, and then he invites us to be active participate, participants in the ongoing work of being changed from the inside out. So here's the thing. God does all the big changes. He, does, he provides salvation, but then he wants us to be active participants. It's not like, you know, I went to go watch a football game yesterday, and I'm sitting on the sidelines, and I'm watching these eighth graders, and I'm like, man, I can shave and just, you know, they wouldn't know. You know, I just shave, and I just like put on, you know, like I'm, they're, they're taller than me, these eighth, eighth graders, you know what I'm saying? Uh, they would not even know, you know, until I hit them, man. That's man strength coming on you, boy. <laughs> Eighth grade, 55 pounds, I'm going to smash you, son, you know. <laughs> Jesus, thank God I wasn't playing, right? But I was on the sidelines. And, and here's the thing, I was, a, I, I was a spectator of what was taking place. I was a spectator of this great game we call football. But I'll tell you what, in our faith, we're not called to be spectators, we're called to be participators. We're called not just to watch from the bench and just kind of think and, and say that would be nice. No, God invites us to participate in this life change that happens. And so he does all the heavy lifting, and then he says, son, daughter, I want to bring you along, and I want you to now participate in this life change. He does it in two ways. Maybe you want to write these down. First way that God really brings about change in our lives is through relationship. It's through relationship, and that primary relationship is a relationship with God. Like, here, here's, here's the way that w this works. It's like the more time we spend with people, the more we act like them, right? And that can be a good thing, or that can be a bad thing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, some people, you're like, I need to avoid them because I act crazy when I'm around them. And other people, you're like, man, I love to be around them because I'm my best me when I'm around them. Um, something interesting, I grew up in southern Colorado, if you didn't know that. Uh, and, and southern Colorado is really close to northern New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico is a part of the United States. A lot of people don't understand that. And, uh, um, but my wife, she grew up in New Mexico. And there's something interesting that happens. Like, she's a very professional, you know, well put together, like amazing woman. She walks with this grace. You're just like, mm, that girl, she, she's dope, you know. Like, uh, she, she's very professional. She, like, she, in her work environments, you know, like I see the emails she sends out. I'm like, man, that girl's on point, you know. And uh, so she's all that. But you get her around her family, and all of a sudden there's this accent that comes from northern New Mexico. It's horrendous. <laughs> she goes from, yes, ma'am, it would be great to serve you today, uh, to all kind of other, like, you know what I'm talking about? Nah. Like, and you're like, wait up, what'd you just say? <laughs> Translation. And those of you that know people from northern New Mexico, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so like, it, they, like, sing when they talk, too. It's like, we're going to go to the store. <laughs> or, did you guys go to the store? Have you been to the store lately? <laughs> I met this kid. I was doing an outreach in northern New Mexico, Las Vegas, New Mexico, and, and this kid comes up, and, and there was a dog. There was a bunch of people, and there's a dog, and he just comes up, and he's like, is this your guy's this dog? And I was like, is this, was that English? <laughs> is this your guy's dog? And, uh, and so you get my wife around her family, and she goes from Miss Professional to what? Like, what? Miss Northern New Mexico? Like, come on, green chili and red chili and all that stuff, you know? <laughs> How do you want your chili? I want it Christmas, you know, red and green. So anyway, I'm Sorry. But you got what I'm saying, right? Right? Like the accent comes on. She's a totally different person. Then we get back home. It lasts for a few days, and then she gets back to normal. 
point is, relationships are powerful. And who you spend time with is going to really uh, develop your character or discourage your character development. And so not only is it important for us to spend time with God and grow with Him, but it's important for us also to spend time with people that are going to help us mature and develop. And so uh, as we're really winding this down to a close today, I want you to understand that the first thing that God uses and invites you into in terms of participation is relationships. Get around some good people. And not only good people like Sunday mornings, I love Sunday mornings, but get around some good people in a small group environment, in a service team environment, because then you know what? Those people are going to help you grow and develop and be who God has destined you to be. The second thing that he invites us to daily uh, to, to, to participate in is what I would call daily partnership with his spirit to put off our old self and put on our new self. And so he invites us to daily partnership with His Spirit to put off our old self and to put on the new self. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. Beautiful description. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, love the verbiage, throw off everything or throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. Again, throw off this old person. Throw off the old stuff, the old way of thinking, the old way of acting, the old way of relating and interacting, the old way of of speaking. Take it off. Throw off your old sinful nature uh, and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So it's this throwing off. It goes on to read, and it, and it really puts us into such a great light. Verse 23, it says, Instead, let the Spirit, what Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Again, God doesn't start with the behavior modification. He doesn't start with the external. He doesn't tar- start with the outside. He starts with the thoughts and the attitudes. He doesn't start with, like, don't use those four-letter words no more. Right? Right? You're like, what four-letter words? I never said nothing like that, you know? He's like, don't, and, and we just want to like, if I can just stop doing all the bad stuff, if, then, then I'll be okay. God's like, man, I'm not interested in all this stuff. I'm interested in your heart. I want to work on your heart. And so instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts, renew your attitudes, because ultimately our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, our actions determine our interactions, and it determines the quality of our lives. We need to allow the Spirit of God to work in us, to renew us by thoughts, by the depth of our, in the depth of our thoughts and attitudes. And then it says this, so not only are we putting off in partnership with the Holy Spirit, we're also in partnership with the Holy Spirit, putting on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy and so in this changing work of God in our lives he says put off the old and put on the new as God begins to change us it shows up in the way we think and what we say and what we do and how we interact with others it doesn't mean that we become perfect but God is definitely working on completing us in fact we're going to talk more about that next week as not only are we discovering that God chooses us and God changes us But God completes us. We're going to talk about that next week. You won't want to miss it. But what does it mean? If God changes us, what does it mean? What does it look like? It means, quite simply, we no longer think, talk, act, or interact as we used to. But there are days when the old person is going to come out. There are moments when that old person is going to rise up and demand that you be that old person. You know what I'm talking about. You go from nice to not so nice in a moment. You you go from God bless you to God stop me from killing that person. 
And the truth is, is that that old person will rise up. And every day that that old person rises up, here's the lie you begin to believe. That's who I am. A horrible parent, a horrible spouse, a horrible coworker. You start to live in those lies that this is who I am. And this is who who I've always been. And this is who I'm always going to be. I want you to listen to the voice of God Almighty today that says you are changed from the inside out. And when the old rises up, you got to take spiritual authority and say, that's not who I am. And yeah, I acted like that old person for a minute. I was busted up like that old person for a minute. But that's not who I am. I'm new in Christ. I think different. I act different. I talk different. I am different because of what God has done in my heart and in my life. Your old person may resurface for a moment, but it doesn't define you. Only Christ defines you. He chooses you. We find a new identity in him. And he's working on changing us. And so as a takeaway today, I want to leave you with this. We are changed by God. The old is gone. The new is here. We are changed by God. I know it doesn't always feel that way. And I know we look at, I've been serving God for 21 years. And let me just say, after 21 years of serving God, there's some, still some old stuff that rises up. There's some old ways of thinking. There's some old ways. And in those moments, I've got to remind myself because I get hard, I'm hard on myself. I'm hard on myself. And in that moment, I'm like, you. I just want to beat myself up. And in that moment, when I'm trying to beat myself up, God's trying to say, that's who you were. And remember that, but that's not who you are. And when the enemy's trying to tell you that's who you are, you remind him, -uh, I I know I slipped up, but that's not who I am. That's who I was. Who I am now is chosen in God, changed by God, completed in God, called by God. I'm new in Jesus. So with every eye closed in this place, everyone reverencing God, if you're here today and you're saying, look, Man, I I was moved by the change of God in my life or by hearing about change. But I've never really allowed God to change me. I've never committed my life to him. Or maybe there's some of you here and you say, man, not only have I never allowed God to change, you're like, I I, I started that path and I I lost my way. I need to come back. If you're here today and you say, look, I need to commit my life to Christ so that he can change me. Maybe it's for the first time, or maybe you're recommitting your life to him. But if that's you, would you just raise your hand right where you're at and then put it right back down. There are hands going up all over this place. You say, that's me. Would you just lift your hand and say, I'm ready to commit my life to Christ, or I'm ready to recommit my life to Christ. Would you just lift your hand real high and then put it right back down. Man, hands all over this place. I just want you to repeat this simple prayer with me. Would you say, Jesus... All all of us, would you just say, Jesus, change me from the inside out. Make me new and take away the old. Holy Spirit, help me to be that new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We thank God for those that are responding today.